Marjorie, I can see you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, guys, welcome to our webinar today. And just to tell you a little bit more about the organization that I work for, I work for Wild the Ocean, which is one of the Wild Trust Marine Program. So basically what we do is that we work in the interface between the um, environmental conservation and also the social economic uh, development. And we do have various projects that we do um, from recycling to collection of waste uh, to ocean stewards, where we empower the newly graduate uh, students straight from university with the skills. And they go out on the boat and they do the actual work, which is more hands on. And uh, um, just to talk about um, now to move on to the MPA project, which is the project that advances the marine protection in South Africa. So we do have lots of other um, awareness campaigns. I'm sure some of you might, might have heard of um, Only This March campaign, which was mainly very active last year. But now we have one which is called the Ocean Impact, where we are like the voice and we've got this youth that are supporting all our awareness campaigns to push our message and spread all the messages to uh, people around South Africa and all over the world to please take care of our ocean. So without um, wasting much time, I would like to uh, maybe introduce you to the speaker for today. And some of you might know him. His name is Wesley Dalton. So he will be talking to us today about the MPAs and how they are being zoned and what kind of life is being protected there. And then today, I mean, his presentation, surely he's going to blow you away because then you will understand why we need more um, protection. But just to talk you through to who Wellesley is, I know he's going to do his introduction as well, but let me just talk you through to his um, bio a bit. He is a marine biologist and he loves fish. And I've seen that he likes going out and catching fish, but the nicest thing I like about him is that he released the fish back into the ocean. So he's a very responsible fisherman. And he just graduated with his MSc um, uh, at uh, UKZN. So well done on that. And we hope that we are going to see your PhD pretty soon. Okay. Okay. So. Um, if I could just ask you to please take over now, guys, just a quick reminder that if you have phones, well, most of you are actually muted, but just to make sure that you don't get interrupted or our speaker doesn't get interrupted, if you could please make sure that if you are unmuted, you, are, you, unmute, you, you mute yourself. And hopefully everything is gonna go well. So Wesley, over to you. Thanks so much, Dudu. Hi, everyone. I'm going to just share my screen quick so we can get to the presentation. Right. Can everyone see that? Perfect. Okay. Good to go. Right. Welcome, everyone. My name is Wesley Dalton, as Dudu said. And today's speech is entitled Location, Location, Location. And we're gonna have a quick look at MPAs, how they benefit the fish stocks and some iconic fish species. So Dudu's pretty much covered my intro, but I'll just re-go over it. As I said, I'm Wesley Dalton. I'm a marine biologist. I've recently graduated with my MSc from UKZN. Um, some of the research I was working on was using baited remote underwater video, which are called BRUVs to examine the spatial distribution of demersal fish species. So demersal fish are those that spend their time close to the seafloor or on the seafloor. So we're having a look at those. Most of the images you'll see from throughout my presentation today are from those bruvs. Those that aren't will have a little image source underneath them. Um, as Dudu said, I've got a bit of a fish obsession. I'm absolutely crazy about them and I joined the Ocean Stewards program in 2016. So just a brief look at what we're going to go over today. Just for those who aren't familiar with marine protected areas, I'm going to go over what marine protected areas are. Very basic overview. Um, I know it was covered in last week's seminar, if anyone watched that. Um, I'm going to look at the MPAs in South Africa, how many there are, where they are. MPA design in South Africa, I'm just going to briefly skim over it. 
and then also look in more detail how the MPAs are zoned for fisheries, and then we'll look into some of the iconic species that benefit from MPAs. So I'm just going to read this definition to you. It's the IUC definition for marine protected areas, and it goes as follows. A clearly defined geographical space recognized, dedicated and managed through legal or other effective means to achieve the long term conservation of nature with associated ecosystem services and cultural values. So basically, it's an area of the ocean or the coastline that is protected under law and is managed to achieve a positive outcome for the ecosystem. MPAs in South Africa, there are currently 42 MPAs under South Africa's control. 41 are located in our EEZ, as you can see from this map. And then the 42nd one is located in the Southern Ocean uh, around the Prince Edward Islands. These 20 new MPAs were declared on the 23rd of May in 2019. Their declaration is in Gazette number 42478 and all the regulations can be seen in 42479. So if anyone is interested in reading through those, they are very long documents, but those are the ones you need to check out. Right, onto MPA design in South Africa. So a very important part of this is reviewing previous MPAs. So the objective is to look where these MPAs are located, what some of their management goals are, what are they protecting, why were they put there? And basically it's to help identify where protection is lacking. From there, you can move on to identifying priority areas. So this is a process that uses vast amounts of scientific research as well as socioeconomic research. It compiles these into different layers and it goes through a very long process before these areas can then be identified. And from there, we look at what's currently in those areas, why you want to protect those areas and the process moves on. If you want to look at how priority areas are identified, the National Spatial Biodiversity Assessment the marine component of it, um, Lombard et al. 2004, is very informative. So if you want more details, have a look through there. Another important component of MPA design is obviously your stakeholder engagement. This is so that multiple users can get access out of the MPAs. And then legislation is also another important part. And that's gonna be covered in next week's seminar. So if anyone's interested in the, in the legislation side of things, watch next week's seminar. Um, if you want more information on MPA designs, there's a lovely piece of, a piece of work written up by Kerry Sink and Colin Atwood uh, called Guidelines for Offshore Marine Protected Areas in South Africa. Dudu does have the links for these, so I'm not sure if she's sharing them in the chat. If not, she'll be able to get them to you guys. So how are MPAs zoned for fisheries? This is the section that I'm gonna go into quite a lot of details for. Um, South African MPAs can essentially be defined into three types. Those that are entirely restricted zones, those that are entirely controlled zones, and then those that are a combination of restricted and controlled zones, which are the, the, the most common, commonly used ones. Restricted zones can then be divided, divided into inshore restricted zones and offshore restricted zones. Then onto your controlled zones, you can have controlled inshore and controlled offshore. Then there's controlled pelagic, catch and release, and controlled commercial. So I'm gonna go through each one of these separately. Um, I've got a link at the bottom there called a very useful, a very useful link that hopefully Dudu can share as well. Um, it was put together by Sambra and it allows you to have a look at the MPAs and how they're zoned by uploading a file onto Google Maps and you can click onto it and it'll tell you the regulations for the MPA. So if you want more details, you can have a look there. So I'm going to use the Tugela MPA as an example, um, just because it's one of the new MPAs and I'm particularly more familiar with the KZN MPAs. So what I'm just going to run through off these, this slide and the next one is the different zones. So hopefully my cursor will show up here. We're just going to have a look at these acronyms and what they stand for. So it's the Imtanzini Inshore Controlled Zone, the Matsukulu Inshore Restricted Zone, the Tugela Inshore Controlled Zone, and then this last one 
is the stati oh, sorry, my pronunciation of it is terrible, but it's the Stateni controlled zone, restricted zone, sorry. So then onto this one is the offshore sections. Let's see if my cursor will show up. So at the top here, we have the Tugela offshore controlled zone north. This little area on the right is the Tugela offshore controlled pelagic zone. You have the Tugela offshore restricted zone, Tugela offshore controlled zone south, and then the Tugela offshore controlled, controlled commercial zone. So these zones, I'm going to go through each of them separately, but I just want to point out while we're looking at this map, because it'll come up later in an example I use. This area here that is in the restricted zone, the Tugela Canyon runs out along through the restricted zone and down into this controlled commercial zone. And as I said, that'll come up a little bit later, but I just want you to guys to know where it is. So restricted zones. These are also referred to as no-take zones. They are highly controlled areas and do not allow any extractive activities. So no fishing, no removing of any organisms whatsoever. Um, it's particularly important that vessels that do travel through these areas do so under strict rules. So vessels have to have an AIS, it's an automated identification system. Any, any um, gear must be stowed away in terms of fishing gear or other devices. Um, they may not stop in the MPA, they may not drop anchor in the MPA in the restricted zones. And yeah, it's probably the most beneficial zone for fish stocks. The habitat is fully protected by this zone because there's no anchoring, there's no removal. The fish are also fully protected because there's no fishing allowed. And it allows resident species to mature. So a lot of our reef species are slow growing and take a number of years to mature. They also provide benefits to fisheries. So there's the spillover effect. This is where either eggs or larvae drift out through the currents out of the MPA or adults migrate out of the MPA and then can be utilized by the surrounding fisheries. And it also helps to manage stock because it allows those older fish to mature. There's something called BOF, which is the BOF hypothesis, which stands for big old fat fecund female fish. Um, basically what that means is that the hypothesis says that bigger female fish can generally produce a larger quantity of eggs as well as larger eggs that are of better quality. So it's a very important theory and it's often used to support why MPA should be used managing fish stocks. Um, if you have a look at the two images I have on the right, that's an example of the reef habitat that is potentially uh, protected by a restricted zone. And then also two of the species that are potentially protected by restricted zones. So there's a yellow belly rock cod there, which is a slow growing species. And then behind it is a commercially important species called slinger. Inshore controlled zones. These, these zones mostly govern what happens in the land-based fishery. Um, in the recreational sector, the species are generally broken down into edibles and inedibles. That's not to say that the inedibles can't be eaten because they are across the world, but it's just how they are broken down by the recreational sector. So I've used that to explain the different sections. Um, so in these inshore controlled zones, edible species can be targeted by anglers with a valid fishing permit. Um, all the standard regulations still apply. So you still have to keep to your bag limits, your size limits, closed seasons. Um, your inedible species can also be targeted but they cannot be kept, so they have to be released. So on the right-hand side there, you can see a commonly targeted shore species, which is carantine. And then below, we've got two ray species, which is the blue ray, and underneath them is a diamond ray. They are both often caught by shore anglers. Um, fortunately, most of the anglers nowadays practice catch and release for the inedible species, which is a great benefit, but these MPAs certainly help. Um, so it obviously provides protection to sharks and rays because they have to be released. And it also allows fishermen access the area. 
So they're still getting to be able to utilize the resources. The offshore controlled zone, this controls your boat-based activities. Again, I've broken it down into edible species and inedible species. This zone is very similar to the inshore controlled zone in that your edible species can be targeted and can be kept within the normal bag limits and you have to have your valid permits, et cetera. Um, your inedible species, however, cannot be targeted at all. So you can't put chum out, you can't put any baits for sharks. So these areas are particularly important because they provide full protection for sharks and rays, but at the same time, it still allows fishermen to go in and use the resource. So on the right hand side, again, there's a typical um, edible fish, which is an Englishman, and below that, a thorntail ray which is an inedible. The controlled pelagic zone. So this again controls boat-based activities and is slightly more restrictive than the controlled, controlled zones. Um, edible species that are listed in Annexure 2, so that's within the Gazette number 42479, where the regulations are stated. Um, this has a list of species that can be targeted in this zone. So it's basically all your pelagic species, those that swim in the upper layers of the water column and protects all of the non-pelagic species, more your demersal species, um, your reef fish and your bottom fish. Uh, sharks and rays are also fully protected in this zone. They can't be targeted. Um, so it provides a lot of benefits. There's full protection for the sharks and rays, full protection for your reef, your reef fish and also full protection for the habitats. So all these zones, I did not mention, I mentioned it for the restricted zone, but all these zones, you may not drop anchor in. So you cannot anchor in an MPA unless you have a specific permit to do so. And that has to be applied for through government. And yeah, so the two pictures on the right, again, um, some species that you can target, which is the tropical yellowtail. He's the one in this top image with the long dorsal. And then a Santa is one of the bottom species that you may not target in this zone. And then obviously rag, ragged tooth shark, you may not target in this zone. And this is an example of the reef habitat that could be protected in this area as well. So catch and release zone. This is again, possibly my favorite zone. I do enjoy fishing. There is not a catch and release zone in Tegela. However, there is one in Isamangalisa. Um, the regulations are very similar to that, oh sorry, the regulations are the same for the catch and release zones inshore and offshore. So you can only use barbless hooks. So if you have a look at that image on the right, the hook on the left is one that's got a barb on. You can see the barb over here, whereas the hook on the right has had that barb squashed flat. So all that means is it's, it's better for the fish. Um, it's less damage, it's easier to remove. Um, they also, nowadays, we tend to recommend fishermen use circle hooks in these zones as well. So these are examples of circle hooks as opposed to the more traditional J hooks. Um, they're just generally better for the fish. Um, it's a particularly important zone, this as well, because it provides full protection for the fish, but at the same time, anglers can still go out there and enjoy themselves and enjoy the sport. So the controlled commercial zone. So this is quite an interesting one, particularly in the Tugela region. Um, it can only be fished with a commercial line fishing license. So no netting can take place, only commercial line fishing and no recreational anglers are allowed in this area either. Um, you require a special permit if you wish to fish between the hours of sunset and sunrise. So it's through the hours of dark. Um, the reason for this is because certain species are more prolific feeders during the night and they're trying to protect those. Um, the benefits of this kind of zone is that it's only receiving pressure from one sector of the fishing industry. However, it's rather interesting in that this zone is now, once the rights for the Tugela commercial fishermen are expire, this zone is going to become a restricted zone. So an agreement was reached where these, where these commercial fishermen can go into this zone while they still have a valid license, fish it. However, once the current licenses expire, they can renew their license, but they'll no longer be able to fish in that zone. So it'll become a restricted zone and help protect that canyon that we discussed earlier. 
So now onto some of the iconic fish species. Um, there's so many to choose from. I mean, it's, it's an absolutely incredible list that we have. And it was really hard for me to cut it down to just a few. Um, so what I've tried to do is present some of the more rare species. Those are, that are endemic, um, species that are under heavy pressure. Um, and that can all be assisted by marine protected areas. Um, if you wish to have an in-depth look at particularly lionfish species, then I suggest having a look at the Southern African Marine Lionfish Profiles by Bruce Mann. Um, it's an incredible piece of literature with all sorts of information in there. Hopefully Dudu can share the link for that as well. Um, it's got everything from breeding to movements to stock assessments. So I've covered a little bit of information for the iconic species in here. But yeah, it's a really great piece of literature. So now we've got a few pictures at the bottom to make the session a little bit interactive. We'll just see if anyone's able to identify what's there. You're welcome to comment in the chat and hopefully Dudu will be able to say you got it right or not. I can't see the chat at the moment. There we go. So if anyone would like to take a guess as to what the species are at the bottom there. Yep, we've got a raggy. No, there's no Dorado there. Any other takers on what might be there? Ragged tooth shark, yes. Third cat face rock art, yes. Fourth Englishman, no. So the fourth one is actually a Santa. Um, he does have very similar red and silver barring to an Englishman. However, an Englishman's got a much deeper forehead to him. Um, there are 74s behind the cat face rock art there. And any guesses on the second one? That's the only one we haven't had a guess for yet. No takers. Oh, there we go. Dudu's answered. The second one is a false Englishman. So he's very similar to the Englishman. However, he's got much longer dorsals and he's got this interesting looking shape on his forehead. Okay, moving on. Sorry, screen's just frozen. There we go. So our first iconic species that we're gonna have a look at is the Khaoyun. This is our national fish. It's an endemic species uh, to Southern Africa. So it's found, it's, it's been reported in the, in the lower reaches of KZN. However, this is very rare and it's generally found more commonly as you move west towards the cooler water. Um, the females of the species actually tend to grow larger than the males. Um, so it's an inshore species, so it's often targeted by the recreational fishing sector. It cannot be targeted by commercial fishermen. The species is said to be collapsed and it enjoys a habitat of a mixture of rocks and sand in the wash zone. Um, several studies have been conducted in the Duhurp Nature Reserve on the species. Uh, most of them uh, catch per unit effort. Um, you can find a list of those in the guide by Bruce Mann, but Basically, they've all shown that this MPA has had a huge impact on the species and a positive impact. So it's, it's shown an increase in size, an increase in catch per unit effort, and has also shown that there's potential spillover effect. So adults moving out of the area and being able to be targeted by fishermen outside the reserve. So that's a fantastic little cold water species. The slinger. 
So this is a, also a very interesting species. It's considered a protogenous hermaphrodite. So what that means is this fish changes from female to male as it gets older. It's believed that they change sex around five years of age. And it again is an endemic species to the southeast coast of Africa. Um, it's an offshore species. Although the juveniles can be found shallower, they generally prefer reef habitat from 30 meters down to over 100 meters. Um, it's currently the most important species in the KwaZulu Natal lionfish sector, in the commercial sector. Together with Santa, which you saw an image of when we were doing the guesses there, it makes up approximately 45% of the commercial lionfish catch. Um, and it's also targeted extensively by the recreational sector. However, the last stock assessment found that it was being optimally exploited, which is a good thing. However, we still need to make sure that we maintain these stock levels. So MPAs are very important for protecting the habitat these slinger use. Um, as I said, they generally resident reef species. So restricted zones over reef are particularly important for them. They do spawn offshore and it also allows them to reach that sex change age in the MPAs where they can grow bigger and live longer. So it's, a, it's particularly important for the maintenance of the species that they are provided that protection. The 74. So this is one with quite a story. It was fished heavily by the commercial and recreational sector in the 20th century. And in the 1960s, the stock collapsed. So a moratorium was put on it in 1998. What that means is that nobody was allowed to fish for it anymore. Um, a stock assessment in 2007 showed little signs of recovery. So the, the moratorium is still in place. Um, however, there were some good looking signs. There were a few more juveniles around and some much larger individuals. Now that top picture there is one that I found particularly exciting on my bruvs. As much as we can't measure size with the bruvs that I use, this little canister at the bottom here is approximately 12 centimeters across, which puts this fish probably close to around a meter, which is a really nice large adult for the species. Um, so it's exciting to see. They also commonly known for that big black mark on their side. And also, if you have a look at this bottom image, um, you can see those blue and yellow lines. It's very distinctive fish and not easily confused with others. Um, it's believed to be a migratory species. And again, it's endemic to the southeast coast of Africa, found from KZN down south. Um, yeah, as the stock has collapsed and it's now a prohibited species, so you can't target it at all. Um, any fish that are caught accidentally have to be released. And hopefully we'll see the stocks of this recover in a few years. But MPAs play an important role in this, in that, again, it provides protection for habitat. And also, although they're migratory, it does provide protection for adults when they migrate into KZN. The black muscle cracker, also called the punskop. I hope I said that right. Afrikaans pronunciation is not my best. Um, the species is endemic to South Africa. It's an offshore species, very resident, and prefers reef habitats. Although the stock has not been assessed, it's believed that it's taken a massive decline. Um, this is an incredibly slow growing species and like the slinger is a as a protogenous hermaphrodite, so it changes from female to male. The females only mature at approximately 10 years of age, and it's believed that they only change sex around 18 years of age. So it's an exceptionally slow maturing, slow growing fish, um, and it is heavily targeted by the recreational sector. Um, the commercials do target it, and they are allowed to target it, but it's not as frequently targeted by the commercials. Um, yeah, so again, another 
slow growing resident species that requires protection from MPAs. And for the same reasons as those I've mentioned before, uh, important habitat protection, protecting those reefs and allowing these fish to reach that mature size where they're able to spawn and reproduce. Hake. So there's two species of hake in South Africa. There's the shallow water hake and the deep water hake. Both are extensively caught in trawls um, for the food industry. I think most of you, if you eat fish, have eaten hake at some point. It's commonly distributed. Um, the two species, as the name suggests, one is generally found slightly more shallow, the other slightly deeper. Um, the shallow water hake is targeted a lot by hand line and line fishery, uh, whereas the deep water hake is predominantly trawl. The shallow water hake does also make up a percentage of that trawl though. Um, they're an offshore species as well and predominantly re resident. However, unlike most resident species, their habitat varies. So they can be found over rocks, they can be found over reef, they can be found over sand. So it's a very interesting species and one that needs to be looked at carefully. To benefit from MPAs, we're going to need some really large offshore MPAs um, just because of the nature of the species and their varied habitat usage. Scallop tamaid. So these are found on the east coast of South Africa, but you can find them in most tropical waters and warm temperate waters. They are critically endangered according to the IUCN. Um, they are really under pressure. So the movement varies. There's been research that's shown some individuals will remain resident over specific reefs, whereas others have shown migratory behavior and migrate long distances. Um, the Protea Banks MPA is going to be particularly important for these guys. They are found aggregating there at certain times of the year. So that's hopefully going to provide them with some nice protection. Um, the Tugela Banks MPA as well, as often the juveniles are found up in the Tugela region. So hopefully these guys will benefit from some of that, particularly the individuals that are resident, but also those that aggregate together. And finally, onto our last species, the coelacanth. An exceptionally rare species. It was rediscovered in 1938 after presumed to be extinct for many, many years. Um, it was discovered in a trawl survey. Some very rough drawings were sent off to JLB Smith and he asked for the specimen to be preserved and as they say, the rest is history. Um, since then, they've been found in the Comores, Kenya, Tanzania, Mozambique, and Madagascar, um, but their population is incredibly small. So there's less than 35 known individuals at the moment. Um, and those have all been located up in the East Mangaluliso MPA. However, there was one recently, I believe it was last year, but don't quote me on that, um, that was seen on the south coast of KZN. I'm not sure if this individual has been identified and if it's part of the Isamangaliso or if it's a new individual, I can't say for sure. Um, so that was an interesting discovery and I don't know what has happened since then with that, with regards to that, but it'll be interesting to see if there's another subpopulation. Um, these are generally found in very deep water. They prefer hiding in caves in the canyons. Um, they're an absolutely incredible fish. I've been fortunate enough to be on two expeditions where we've found them with an ROV and it's, it's really something that you can't explain. It's something that you have to experience to know that such an ancient prehistoric fish is just sitting there underneath you is incredible. Um, they're absolutely unbelievable creatures. They just move differently. They look different. They're incredibly large as well. I think the smallest specimen to date that's been measured alive has been around a meter with the Isamangaliso cohort. Um, so very interesting fish. It is prohibited to fish for the species in any way, which is great because the population numbers are so low. And as I said, it gets great protection from, great protection from the Isamangaliso wetland park. 
So just to sum up what we've chatted about today, um, MPAs are clearly an important component of fisheries management. They contribute greatly to habitat protection. They allow slow growing resident species to mature, reach sexual maturity, spawn, and in the cases of the hermaphrodite species to actually change sex. The zonation of MPAs are key and allow the users to benefit while still providing protection for the fish species. And spillover is also an important aspect of that as it contributes to the species, as it contributes to the fisheries who can access these the this, this spillover stock and make use of it. Um, and then finally, the iconic species. We have a number of iconic species, and many of these benefit from the implementation of MPAs. So just to go through those images at the bottom to end off. Um, there's a few different species down there. On the left, starting from the left, we've got a round ribbon tail with a black muscle cracker and a yellow tail. Then we've got a Dane with some slinger, a zebra, and a few other species. There's 74. There's a big soldier bream, king soldier bream, and then finally some raggies, which we saw up towards Tegela. Um, so thank you for your time. And are there any questions? Oh, thank you so much. Um, um, I can still see it's written questions there. Um, Wellesley, for an interesting presentation. And I think what makes uh, your presentation even amazing is the fact that you are a young person who's done such an incredible work in the field and also just getting all this motivational speaking. For me, I think it is motivating to see why we need more protection and what exactly is it that we need to protect because people, when they see the ocean, all they get to see is water. They don't really know much about all the animals that are actually hidden underneath that blue blanket. And thank you for unraveling that uh, to us and just taking us through to those various animals and um, um, teaching us about why it's important that they are protected. And I'm actually very grateful to say that you are a member of the Youth for MPA, which is a movement which is led by Young South Africa and also joining other international youth movements. So if we have anyone here in the audience who would like to be part of this movement, I will be leaving my details, my email, and also um, a sign up a survey or should I say link that you guys can just quickly fill up so that you can learn more about the movement and hopefully join the movement. So now I can see it's questions time and let's see what the guys are asking. Um, okay, so I've got one here from Lauren and it says, would you say that recreational fishers are well versed in which species they can or cannot catch, especially in MPAs? And with regards to catch and release practices, are you the minority? So thanks for that question, a very interesting one. Um, yeah, so that's the thing is, there's, I would say there's a split in the anglers. Some are very well versed in the species they're targeting and how to handle these species and the best practices to, to make sure they have a successful release. Um, whereas other anglers, have very limited knowledge and you know not the best handling so it's a very challenging thing to approach and i definitely think there needs to be more education in the anglers um yeah more edu education amongst the anglers to get these points across and i know there are a number of people out there who advocate for conservation who who say you know, who, who explain to the guys how to handle the different fish. I know Ari have done a series now on YouTube um, where they go through, for their, for their tagging project, where they go through how to handle, you know, rays, sharks, edible fish. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a sector that needs more education. Um, so yeah, I hope I've answered that fully. Thank you. And the next one actually comes from Russell Stevens. And if I need to be corrected on this one, he heads the education department 
at Two Oceans Aquarium. So he says, thank you very much for your presentation. Can you highlight how we can educate people about MPAs? Mitigation is not working for much crime in, in South Africa. Awareness is surely key, but how? Yeah, so again, it's a, it's a very challenging thing to, to reach out to all these people because it is such a diverse range of people in the country, you know, people have different levels of education, people have different access to the materials that they get. So it's, it's, it's definitely something that needs to be looked into at possibly a school level where people are going into schools and educating the students on what they, what the benefits of these MPAs are. And even particularly like inland areas, you know, someone up in Joburg, is probably not going to think that the ocean impacts them. But at the end of the day, it's all linked together. I mean, you get your oxygen from the ocean, the rivers flow down from Joburg into the sea, you know, so you've got to, I think it's, it's, you've got to tailor the way you approach the education to your target audience. I think you need to set up a multi, multifaceted um, approach to actually getting the information out there and letting people know what the benefits of these areas are and why we need to keep them protected. And I thought, thank you, Wesley. And I see that Lauren here is trying to also add on to that. And she said, I think it is all about simplifying the complex thing that is, MP that is MPAs and using simple, easy to understand language and practical examples of how MPAs work. Okay, at the moment, I don't see any questions coming through. Then I guess I'm taking you've done a brilliant presentation that people don't even need, don't have anything much to, to um, ask you. But if we, if I've missed any questions somehow, um, don't worry because we are still gonna send you guys the recording. So all those questions will be answered um, when we send you all this stuff. Uh, there is Russell's again. Russell is saying, you mentioned that Hake needed protection better. What plans are there to increase uh, from 42? Oh, um, I assume he means increase the number of MPAs. Um, to be perfectly yeah. honest, um, that's a question I can't fully answer for you right now. I'm still very much, I suppose, at a lower level of the MPA game when it comes to actual experience-wise. And there's, the, you know, the more senior scientists tend to deal with this, whereas I've been more assisting with the practical side of things, the field work, and then obviously focusing on my master's research. So I think there's probably better suited people out there to answer that question. And perhaps it's something that we can get in touch with a few people, get an answer, and then Dudu will be able to we email. We will send it back to, to him, yeah. Cool. I think that will be it then. Um, Okay, people are saying there is Dr. Natalie Phil Yoon. Yeah, she's saying thank you, Wesley. And then people are really, really impressed. There is Russell saying thank you so much for the work which you've done, which you do. Well done on your presentation. Um, on that note, I'd like to thank everyone who has joined us today. And just to remind you that next week, Thursday, which will be the 17th of September, we are going to be having Sia Bonga Gulisa from the Department of, Envi of Environment forest and fisheries, which is DEF, and he will be talking to us about the designation and management of MPAs in South Africa. So it all looks at the legislations and policies. So please make sure that you join us next week and we will send you the ad. So please make sure that you do um, sign in so that you can be part of it. But other than that, thank you so much. Have a wonderful thank evening. You, everybody. Thank you, bye-bye.